Hey, welcome to the show, everybody. Um, we've got a uh, return author with us, uh, Mark Olshaker. Uh, he is co-author with John Douglas of When a Killer Calls. Uh, it's a haunting story of murder, criminal profiling, and justice in a small town. Um, this is from the cases of the FBI's original Mind Hunter. This is the book two in this series. Um, this is published February 1st, 2022 from Day Street Books. Um, so it was, I've got that hard copy coming. Um, I'm, Mark Olshaker is going to hold up the actual physical copy. I'll have pictures to show here. But this one was a fantastic story. Somewhere around 3.25 p.m., a Chevy Chevette pulls into a long driveway and stops to check the mail. This is a routine that Sherry Smith has done many times prior before heading up the driveway to her home. Bob Smith, father, sits looks out the window and sees down the driveway and sees that her vehicle is still parked there at the entrance. You know, a few minutes goes by and Bob starts to feel something's wrong. So he has an uneasy feeling. So he grabs his keys, gets in his car and drives down the driveway. And what he finds is that the door is open, the car is still running, but there's no Sherry. This was Friday, May 31st, 1985. Mark Olshaker joins us to talk about this latest book with him and John Douglas and he is next. Welcome to the Three Beards Podcast. My name's Craig, along with Austin and Chris. Passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century. Let me out. Chris, how are you today? Doing wonderful. I think he's in, oh, there you are. I sound like you're muted there for a second. No, it's still still that we thought Austin might it's spring break, so we thought he hopefully he was going to be able to join us, but he you know he wasn't able to make it in t- tonight. Maybe he'll get in here a little later on, but I teased it, you know. So hopefully I did it justice, and we'll find out right now. Mark Shaker, how are you, sir? Good. How are you, Craig? Uh, good, good to be back, and that that's quite a cool intro you have. So I, did I um, see? I, I hinted before the show that I was I slightly plagiarized out of the book. So how did I do? No, that that was good. I mean, I, I'm talking about your uh, your filmed intro. I thought that was. Oh yeah. Cool. yeah, well, appreciate that. Yeah, that was um, yeah. done by our former producer. You know, who he, he kind of made that for us, and so it was really really nice of him to do that. So yeah, we really liked it. So, but welcome welcome back, and Thank once you. again, yeah, we. We had you on for the white supremacist, you know, killers. And then we had, then I, this brought up to me. It's like, you know, it was, then was like, you know, would you like to have him back on? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's not, not even, it's yes. And so she sent um, over, you know, advanced cop, you know, the PDF, you know, for mm-hmm. when a killer calls. And so this one, I, if I'm not mistaken. You want me to hold it up? There we go. Yep. That works. Uh, and. When you you teased that to us on the last show, I believe. Yeah, um, it's 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 possible I did, and uh, this is a completely different kind of case from the uh, Joseph Paul Franklin, uh, the um, racist and anti-Semitic uh, serial killer who uh, traveled all over the country and was very mission oriented. <clears throat> this one is a completely different kind, very tragic, uh, as you say. Uh, it started on May 31st, 1985, when 17 year old Sherry Smith, who was about to graduate from high school in three days, uh, 
there we go. Okay. Uh, she was uh, she was abducted from the uh, from the beginning of the driveway that led uh, up the hill to uh, her house. Uh, she was had just stopped to get the mail, and uh, when her father, who was down at the bottom of a long, long driveway, came up, as you say, the car was still running. Her purse was in the car. Um, her shoes were in the car. She had just come from a uh, pool party. And there was no sherry. There were footprints leading to the mailbox and not back. This occasioned what became the largest manhunt in the history of South Carolina. Um, two weeks later, another young girl, this time a nine-year-old, uh, Deborah Faye Helmick, was abducted screaming from the, while her uh, brother and sister were right next to her. Uh, was abducted screaming from the trailer park in which uh, she and her family lived. And in each case, the body was found not too long afterwards. Uh, what's particularly interesting and horrendous about this case was, first of all, and this is what's very unusual about it, shortly after Sherry was abducted, the unknown subject, the unsub as we call them, uh, started calling the parents and talk to the parents and the sister. And um, this is not usual. And this is one of the things that uh, the, F, uh, the, sh the sheriff, James Metz, uh, Lexington County Sheriff, um, had been to the FBI Academy as a National Academy fellow. Uh, so had his deputy, Lewis McCarty. And uh, they wanted the FBI involved, unlike a lot of people. And uh, John Douglas got involved along with uh, um, uh, Ron Walker, who was another uh, profiler on John's staff, and uh, they came down and helped create a profile, created um, a strategy to help uh, find this killer, to bring him out, and um, what they got from these phone calls, uh, most of which were recorded and transcribed, really led to the profile and figuring out what this guy was all about. And he, this was, for me... This really is almost how modern Hollywood does some of these, um, some of these, their killers, the stuff that they have here, where Larry Jean Bell, he would call the house and he would specifically ask for the mom. I would only talk to the mom. You know, it just, it, so it wouldn't, didn't matter. And so here's his mother who's already, and now she's having to deal one on one with the abductor that, you know, what they thought at the time, the abductor of their child. Right. And didn't know who it was, of course. At that yeah. Um, they also knew that uh, he seemed to be very criminally sophisticated. He was using a voice modulator to change his voice. Um, this was long before cell phones, of course. Uh, the police, after the first call, put a trap and trace on the line. But he seemed to know enough to get off just before uh, the police could uh, trace the call. All the calls, it turns out, were made from pay phones, um, around the area. So uh, he was very criminally sophisticated. Yeah, because well, the, in one of those, um, I, I said I don't want to jump around too much, but he, that was the one, and I'm looking here, I, their names just failed me. Um, it, it, was, it was the undersheriff. Um, Lou, Lou McCarty. Yeah, where he, he used, basically because he would house it, and so it looked like he used their phone at one point yeah. which led them to be not, at that point. Not, yeah, let's not get ahead of the case. Yeah, but, that's why I said it was just, I don't want to get jumped. Right. And that's how sophisticated he was. Yeah, here is the truly impressive and at the same time heartrending aspect of the case. Um, on one of these calls that the unsub made, he said, uh, you can expect a letter from Sherry. He didn't mm -hmm. say, I mean, he said that she was alive, that uh, she had a um, diabetic condition for which she needed either medicine or vast quantities of water. So the parents were very upset, very concerned because she didn't have her medicine with her. It was left in her purse on the front seat of the car with the running engine. In any event, uh, the following Monday, um, uh, 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 the unsub says to expect a letter. Um, the sheriff and uh, Bob Smith, the father, um, and um, a team of investigators go to the post office before it opens, get the postmaster out of bed, tell him to open the post office, and they look through all the mail to find this letter. 
they find the letter. Inside are two pages on a line from a, from a lined legal pad. It's titled Last Will and Testament. Basically, it's the letter, it's the farewell letter that Sherry Smith writes to her family, knowing that this man is going to kill her. But he has allowed her to write this letter, and it is the most searing document of its kind I think I've ever seen, that John Douglas has ever seen. Uh, the grace, the faith, um, I don't know what else to call it, that this 17-year-old girl is able to exhibit. Uh, there you go. Um, knowing she is not all the things she was expecting in life, to graduate, to go to college with her beloved older sister, Dawn, um, to have a family, everything is now going to be gone because she's going to die within minutes or hours. And she expresses her faith. She tells her family to go on. She says she's going to be with uh, God. And it's just, in, it's heartbreaking and it's incredible. And to get mm -hmm. to what you were talking about, uh, Craig, ultimately, it's one of the things that leads to the solution of the case, which is both ironic and, you know, if you talk about faith, you talk about karma, whatever you want to, I mean, this fits right in. Yeah, because this is, and that was one of the questions I had for you too, is this, you know, I'm kind of new to the the true crime area, you know, we're trying to delve into this a little bit. Has this ever been done before where the killer has made the prey, the victim, you know, write something like this and send not it to their family? Not that I know about, certainly not in the kind of uh, predatory uh, violent crimes that uh, John Douglas and I write about. We had never seen anything like this before. I mean, certainly um, uh, we hadn't seen this. We hadn't seen this kind of engagement with the victim family. Uh, we believe that he probably would have called the uh, Helmick family too, except at the time they didn't have a phone in their trailer home. So he kept calling, uh, he kept calling the Smith family. Now what's interesting is Sherry Faye, Sherry Faye Smith's older sister, Dawn, looked almost exactly like her. They, a lot of people thought they were twins, even though there were several years difference between them. They sang together with their father in local churches, community centers, uh, things like that. And you're right that uh, the unsub started talking to, wanting to talk to uh, Hilda Smith, uh, Sherry's mother. Mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, though, he started becoming focused on Dawn. Oh. And uh, when we saw that, that, when John saw the kind of um, obsession he had with Dawn, um, he, um, John realized this is very risky. It's very emotionally fraught, but maybe he, we could use Dawn as bait to bring this guy out. And one of the things that uh, John did was suggest that they, uh, after the funeral, that they stage a memorial service. Um, and with, with a lot of press, a lot of publicity, and um, thinking that they could maybe bring the uh, unsub out. When they finally did catch um, the man who turned out to be Larry Jean Bell, it turned out he had driven by there as John had predicted. But the problem was that the, uh, the, gra uh, the grave site was uh, such that uh, it was too close to the road and, they, um, and he could drive right by without being seen. So they'd be further um, away. Go here. If I'm correct, he was from Alabama. Does anybody know what brought him to Carolina? Um, I think he, he, he had been living there for quite a while. Um, he, um, and he had been living in other places in South Carolina. So I think, um, he may have been born there, but I think, uh, um, he had been living in South Carolina for quite some time. It was clear that he knew the area well. Um, and, uh, in fact, uh, Sherry's body w was found, uh, according to his directions, um, behind a um, um, behind a Masonic lodge uh, in the woods, and this was clearly the kind of place where uh, only somebody who knew the area well uh, would would be able to find and be able to direct. Um, he also uh, held off 
talking about uh, the the dump site where the body was found until enough time and weather had gone by. It was extremely hot uh, in South Carolina at the time so that the body would be uh, decomposed to the point where it wouldn't offer a lot of forensic clues. So this guy was very criminally sophisticated. Um, he was also, we could tell from the kind of, uh, from the kind of phone calls he, he made, uh, he was um, a malignant narcissist, somebody who clearly had no empathy for anybody else. Uh, he had a tremendously elevated view of himself, and um, he was the only thing that was important. Um, and when it came to trial, we're jumping ahead again, when it came to trial, the big issue was not whether he had done it or not. It was pretty obvious what he had done. The big issue was, was this man sane or insane? That, you know, that makes you wonder. Um, he had three sisters. Was he mistreated by women or he just had a he just hated um, the younger? I mean, that just I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, you know, this is something that we write about over and over again in our books, the whole idea of nature versus nurture. And generally, um, these people are. Uh, um, yeah, let's see. That was, I believe, is the Masonic Lodge where mm -hmm. uh, where the um, where Sherry's body was found. So yeah, I mean, he had a um, he didn't have a great background, but it wasn't the kind of abusive background that we hear about in so many other cases. I mean, he was uh, um, in most cases, Chris. What we what we see, and we certainly saw it with this guy, was um, you have a deep seated feeling of inadequacy together with um, a feeling of grandiosity, uh, not having to play by the rules, that uh, everything is uh, should be coming to this person. And yet at the same time, um, uh, or let's say triangulating all of this, is a feeling of resentment that the world is not giving you what you believe should be coming to you. And um, yeah. so I think, yeah, this guy certainly, uh, he... He had been married. He had a son. Uh, he was uh, um, he was divorced. Uh, he was people who knew him thought he a lot of people thought he was strange. Um, he had been uh, he had been in uh, he had been in prison and in a mental institution for um, for some earlier sex crimes. Um, uh, he had been uh, trying to pick up uh, other women uh, and uh, engaging in. Um, obscene phone calls with a 10 year old girl. Uh, so, I mean, he, he had already started down the line. Um, and we believe though it was never proven that before Sherry, he probably killed between one and three other women uh, around this area and up in uh, North Carolina. Um, but he never admitted to that. Uh, the, the circumstantial evidence is pretty good, but um, clearly he had a victim of preference, which was Sherry, and and fantasized that uh, she would, that as soon as he abducted her, she would be in love with him, which of course she wasn't. Uh, he then became obsessed with her sister. But you see, guys like this, if they can't, um, when, when they're ready to kill again or ready to possess again, if they can't find their victim of preference, they'll take what they can get. Um, so then what did he, who, who does he go after next? A nine-year-old girl, just because she's available. Now, interestingly, uh -huh. he's also blonde like Sherry, but um, clearly this is somebody who is completely vulnerable. Um, we don't know to this day exactly what he did to her. Maybe that's a blessing that we don't know because her body was also uh, badly decomposed. But, um, you know, one of the things this gets us into is... Um, is there such a thing as evil in the world? I mean, are some people just really bad? Um, we can talk about whether he was mentally ill or not. I have obviously my own opinions, and I think we can we can support them. But I would I would lean to towards, you know, I would definitely lean towards yes. I mean, to the point because mm -hmm. even one was just like his, you know, some of his behavior towards Don. Yeah, where he would say, you know, God wants you to join Sherry. Yeah, and that was a that was a pretty chilling thought. In one of one of the conversations, mm -hmm. he said, "You know, you can't hide forever. You can't be protected forever. It's just a matter of time." It's just like, yeah, God, God wants you to join Sherry Fay, 
And that was a pretty chilling uh, thing for Dawn, for her parents, and for uh, John and the other investigators. Um, at the same time, it showed us that he was uh, obsessed with her. On the question of uh, uh, mental illness, I would submit, and we've probably talked about this on the last show, um, I would submit to you that anyone who kills in cold blood, um, not defensively, is mentally ill. I mean, that's just not a normal thing to do. Yeah. The question is, the legal question and the moral question is, is this person insane? In other words, is he so mentally ill? And, and when I say he, it's almost always a he in what we're talking mm -hmm. about. But is this person so mentally ill that he is not in control of his actions? I mean, this really goes back several hundred years in British common law to the McNaughton case, uh, where Daniel McNaughton tried to uh, 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 tried to murder uh, Prime Minister Sir Robert Peel, and in the uh, process killed his private secretary. Uh, this became probably the first major case of insanity, and it was uh, he, it was ruled that McNaughton was insane. And the test at the time, back in the 1700s in uh, in London, was it, does this person know the difference between right and wrong and can he control his actions to the point of uh, society's dictates now and mcnaughton couldn't but um here's the thing uh we have a doctrine known as the uh doctrine of the policeman at the elbow which is that if uh if there is a uniformed police officer standing by would this person still commit the crime. If he would, he is probably insane by any legal wow. definition. If he wouldn't, then there's a good chance that he can uh, conform his dictates to the needs of society. So I would submit to you that a lot of these guys, these kind of predators that we're talking about, they do know the difference between right and wrong. They just don't care because their own desires, their own uh, needs, uh, their own obsession with domination, manipulation, control are what's most important to them in life. Everything else in life takes on a secondary, uh, secondary importance. Yeah. No, I, I would agree with that too. Cause just, it was just some of the stuff, like he said, you know, you I would mean, I admit to you, this is a borderline case. No. Question. Oh yeah. Cause well, it's just, it's like, he had, you have that thing where he's like, you know, threatening is that God wants me to kill you, which is, you know, sparks, you know, just flares of, you know, insane. But the fact that he, the meticulous things that he would do, yeah. changing his voice, making sure that he was at some place like the shepherds. Correct. So that way you, it would be traced. It could be traced back to somebody else, not him. He's actually doing these calculated things. And that's not the sign of somebody that's out of control. No, no, he was uh, he was he was very controlled, very organized, um, obsessive compulsive, certainly, because when you transcribe the directions he gave uh, to Dawn to find uh, uh, Deborah May Helmick's body, for instance, uh, you could tell they were written directions. I mean, he was reading. He was reading the directions. Um, and when he got to trial, finally, uh, we're jumping ahead again, when he got to trial, and he's on the witness stand and he says, you know, just out, out of the blue, um, he wanted Dawn to marry him. I mean, that sounds crazy. Um, it's also uh, extremely narcissistic and potentially manipulative. Yeah, that's what well, I'm trying to just, as you were saying. In other words, that. you reward people uh, mm -hmm. by calling them insane for outrageous behavior. What is it, in my head, it was almost like uh, the name of the case is failing me. It's, it was a pretty famous one where the guy snuck in chunky peanut butter in his pants. Mm -hmm. it, it just, and I'll have to try to find it. And it was just one of those during the hit, reached in there, pulled it out and just started eating it. And people are like, oh, my God, he's insane. It was like you said, it was a manipulative thing. I mean, so you could see where this guy could be calculating enough to say, you know, say stuff like that in the courtroom. And people would be like, this guy's crazy. Yeah, I mean, he was certainly, he had certain delusions. I mean, uh, he believed that uh, once he killed these women, that they were going to be waiting for him in heaven to serve him as his handmaidens when he died. 
I mean, that's pretty bizarre. But uh, mm-hmm. but you know, I would I would submit that this uh, this speaks to his incredible narcissism and total lack of empathy or ability to um, personalize anybody else. Everybody else was just in was just an object uh, for them. And I see Carlito Castro has said, narcissists are master manipulators. And when you don't fall for their BS, they don't like you. Absolutely true. Absolutely. Right on, Carlito. Yeah. I, I've, I've, always had a, I've always had a question about, you know, the serial killer mind that we all would like to know. But it's like some of these people rank really high on an IQ test. So... I I just don't understand how they what part of their brain is not working that makes them want to kill, whether it's the obsession, the passion of the blood. I mean, who Mm -hmm. who knows that there's need to be more research on actually figuring out what part of their brain is not functioning properly. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you raise an interesting question, Chris. First of all. Most of them are not that bright. There are no real life Hannibal Lecters. If there were, they would uh, get their satisfaction in other ways. I mean, people like Ted Bundy were reasonably smart. But remember, it's not that their their IQs are so high. It's just they're obsessed with this one thing and they perfect it. And they're thinking about it all the time. And a serial killer by nature is a successful killer. A lot of times it's luck the way they get away. Um, but once they killed once or twice or three times, um, there's Larry Jean Bell. Um, once they kill once or twice or three times, um, they believe that they're good at it. They start to believe their own mythology. They can't be caught. They're smarter than the police. Uh, and, and certainly Larry Jean Bell thought that. He was also such an incredible narcissist that he also uh, uh, kept calling a guy named Charlie Kies, who was a uh, who was a reporter on one of the local stations, and he just wanted all of this uh, recognition. He wanted to control the situation. I mean, when you think about the way he kept talking to the family, at one point he actually described how he killed Sherry Fay, Sherry Fay Smith. Um, this is just incredible manipulation. This is torturing the family emotionally mm-hmm. for his own satisfaction. It's saying, I'm in control. Um, you know, he even, and, and he made up things about uh, how um, much Sherry loved him, which of course was total, you know, BS. So um, this is a guy who um, I have um, no sympathy for and um, uh-uh. I'm glad he was caught. If he hadn't been caught, right when he was, which was about uh, a month, I guess, after uh, Sherry's abduction, there's no question, none whatsoever, that he would have continued killing uh, young girls and young women until he was caught. Yeah, just when I first saw his picture, because I didn't know much about it until I read the book, you can see he's, to me, he's that class kind of, I kind of group people like Ted Bundy Mm -hmm. and these ones and where if you see him walking down the street, you know, you wouldn't give him a second one. No, you second don't through them. Yeah, they look normal. Yeah. You know, they're because everybody thinks when they think serial killer, they're thinking Richard Ramirez. Right. The guys that just look, you know, just, you know, they're just look whacked out. Like, you know, they stick out. These guys look absolutely normal. I mean, this yeah, could be the they guy. Looked, they looked whacked out. They wouldn't be successful at what they did. And in fact, yeah. you can you can tell a lot about the uh, about the nature of the unknown subject, the unsub by the kind of uh, crimes they commit. Um, if you see a blitz style killing where the, uh, or, uh, where, the, uh, where the potential killer, where the offender attacks a woman from behind, say, where she can't see him and renders her unconscious before uh, she can even relate, that tells you something about him. Then he, that could be a whacked out kind of guy because he mm-hmm. clearly he doesn't have the confidence to be able to uh, engage uh, the, his potential victim in conversation, as opposed to somebody like Ted Bundy, who, as you say, was seemed mild mannered. He seemed charming. He was a good looking guy. He could entice uh, women into his control. Yeah, and I, I haven't shown this yet. I wanted to show here, so everybody. This, and obviously, Larry Jean Bell was not that type. Yeah, on the uh, on as as I'm looking at this on the left is Deborah May Helmick, nine years old. <laughs> Yeah, right. Sherry Smith, um, seventeen. Yep, and it's you just—it's just one of those. And if I showed you the picture of Dawn, uh, I could almost superimpose it on Sherry. They looked so much alike. 
yeah, I can, I can bring that up real quick too. Cause it's, um, that was one of those we're just at, let's see, cause I know they had, she's a little, yeah, it's a little bit, I think looking at one of the ones, the ones I've got, um, let's say it's, looks like the only one that's popped up right now is if she's uh, as older. So it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you can see this. Um, yep. Right there. Right here. Yep. You can see they look almost alike. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was, there was one where you should, I can look it up now. Cause I know there was one where it was definitely, it was a, the family photo. Yeah. And Craig, let me say, uh, while we're talking about Dawn, um, she is a real hero of this story. Uh, oh yeah. And she was very generous, gracious, and cooperative with us. She was very brave uh, to do what she did. And she has kind of dedicated her life to um, faith and preserving uh, Sherry's memory. She's a, she's a professional singer. She is, um, uh, she does uh, very good religious work. She has her own ministry. Um, Dawn Smith Jordan is her, is her current name. Yeah. Um, I know King was asking, I wonder if the family ever got closure. Well, they, they, they did in the fact can that. I answer, can I answer that? Because mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's a very, very important question. I'm, I'm glad it was brought up. In the victim's rights movement, we never talk about closure. There is no such thing. Um, this is a wound that stays open forever. And um, I've been fortunate enough, and I'll use that word very advisedly, uh, and John and I have been fortunate enough to become good friends with a, a large number of families that have lost um, family members to homicide. And I can tell you there there is no greater wound, there is no uh, greater emptiness, and uh, there is no such thing as closure, and we don't even talk about it. Um, the grief changes over the time and sometimes there's resolution um, and you know murder is the one crime that there really is no earthly justice for we can try to balance the scales a little bit uh, particularly if we can find the offender and um, and give him justice but there's no earthly justice you can't bring the person back and um, i will say that uh, Sherry's uh, parents, uh, John and uh, um, Bob and Hilda. Uh, Hilda has uh, unfortunately passed away from cancer a number of years ago, but both of them became very, um, very uh, active in the victim support movement. Uh, when Sheriff met, whenever he had another uh, potential uh, uh, victim or survivors of homicide victims, he would call the Smiths and they would go counsel and uh, and try to comfort these people and give them the benefit of their, uh, their faith and experience. So, um, you know, but as far as closure, no. Now is um, one question that was, it didn't pop up on the screen, mm -hmm. but did he have the traits, uh, you know, like the hom homicidal triad? Yeah, we, we believe, I mean, the, the homicidal triad uh, has been, uh, has been defined for a long time. It is, um, there are three primary um, traits that we that if you see them in uh, young boys, you start to worry. Um, one is fire starting, just starting fires for uh, for um, the thrill of it. Another is cruelty to animals, smaller animals, ch smaller children. Um, that's an obvious one. And the um, and the third one is uh, late enuresis or bedwetting. And uh, we believe that probably has to do with frustration over lack of control. We're not we're not sure about that one. That one is not as important as the other two. But uh, yes, I'm not sure. I don't recall about the bedwetting, but certainly, yeah, Larry Jean Bell. Um, he did start fires, and he um, and he experimented with um, torturing small animals. So yes, um, we did see that in him. And in fact, the, the, you know, I think the next question you might asking ask is. Um, well, can somebody like John Douglas uh, tell when uh, a, a, a young boy has the potential to become uh, a dangerous adult? And John's answer is yes, and so can any good elementary school teacher. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. Yeah, it's just it's one of you know because it's pretty easy to tell. I mean, that's in 
because it looks like King had a kind of question, kind of follow up a little bit to what you'd said. It's just where, you know, how do how does one become evil? You know, and and it's, and I, I don't that isn't that the um, million yeah, dollar I mean, question? I, I, kind always, of, I always hesitate to uh, to talk about evil because it's really the realm of philosophers, not of uh, not of investigators. But when I, you know, we just see so much of this these this kind of behavior that there is no other easy explanation for except that it's just evil how you could do this to somebody else to rob somebody else of their future of their of their life of of their parents and uh, siblings and friends joy and companionship just for your own momentary anger rage satisfaction whatever you want to call it um you know, I, I, I use evil as a default. I don't know what else to call it. Yeah. That I kind of like the, where, you know, the closure part, like he said there, I think for me, that was always one after the last show we did with you. And it really kind of stuck with me about the, the closure side. Cause everybody thinks, okay, been killed, you know, all right, family got closure. Yeah. Let's move you know, on. Yeah. yeah. It was because it's one of those, and it, it made sense. It's because there's all those questions that regardless of, okay, Larry Jean, Bell's dead. Okay, well, you still don't know why did he pick? Why did he pick Sherry? Yeah. Why did he pick that moment? What did Sherry? Because as a family, what if Sherry had done something differently? Would she be here this day? So you have all and at, when you guys describe that and through your books, you really lay that part out for this thing to where you see yeah. that there's so many questions that still can, no matter what. I mean, he could write down a confession: yeah. I killed her. I did all this, and I've been killed. But that's still not going to give you all those ones that you want. We, we believe he probably saw her at a shopping center earlier in the day, probably followed her in his car. She, for whatever reason, um, fit his idea of the preferential victim. She was young. She was blonde. She was pretty. Um, so, you know, she and, and she turned out to be in the wrong place at the wrong time um, through no fault of her own. Yeah. And... Um, you know, but he, even through all of these phone calls, uh, and you'll see tr partial transcripts in the book if you read it, he's always talking about himself. You know, it, it's, I mean, he talks about Sherry, but only in terms of himself and what's going to happen to me. And if I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be in the electric chair and I don't want to go to prison and all of that. It's, it's all about him. He really, uh, he can't generate a single bit of empathy for anyone else. Um, and at the same time, yeah. you can tell he's just glorying in his emotional control and domination of this family. That, and that's, and that's the, the thing too. And uh, I kind of, we, we kind of go, jump back a little bit to it where John had reached out to him. How does, you, you know, it's kind of hard for you to ask, you know, what was he thinking at the time? You know, cause you're obviously you're not John. Uh, it's, but you throw all your conversations with him. How hard was it for him to put her in that risk? I mean, because it was actually, you know, it was a great risk for him. Yeah, well, for him, for him, and for her yeah. to, you know, to now have her as the bait. So how? Oh, I'm how, sorry, you're talking about Dawn at this point. Yeah, Dawn at this point. Yeah. So how was this? You know, how did he, you know, get to the point where you know it was he brought? I mean, I know it's important, but it's like, how do you get to this point yeah. where you're like, I got to put another member of this family through this? That is really tough. I mean, that is a, it's a, it's a calculated risk. He talked to Dawn. He talked to her parents about it. Um, he talked to Sheriff Metz. They all were going to protect Dawn, but uh, yeah. And, uh, and certainly the emotional uh, peril to Dawn uh, was great and continued to be great uh, thereafter. Um, but he felt this was the way to um, this was the way to get him out. And what's interesting is we can talk about how he was finally captured. And when he was captured, and um, John started uh, it was was able to uh, to interrogate him and uh, tried to get him close. He came close to admitting the crime. He never actually admitted it. But John said. When did you start feeling bad? You're leading him. When did you start feeling bad about the crime? And he said, when I saw the family and Dawn at the cemetery in that memorial service. So John did get to him um, that way. 
Now, wow. what's very interesting is um, when we talk about how he was um, how he was uh, found. Uh, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, known as SLED, they took the uh, Sherry's two-page uh, last will and testament, and they used what's called an ESDA machine, E-S-D-A. I, I don't remember exactly what it stands for, but it is a uh, it is a machine that looks like a copier, and it can and for pages that were actually part of a pad, it can uh, it can analyze indent indentations in the paper so that it can see what was written on uh, on pages above that one in the pad. And they were able to get a partial phone number um, off the pad. And they uh, they tried all the different combinations of the number. Finally, uh, uh, finally, uh, there's an ESDA machine. OK. And they finally uh, traced it to someone in Alabama. Uh, and they, they started tracing his phone back to uh and they saw there were a lot of calls from there back to a uh, home in lexington south carolina so they started uh tracing back to that and uh, they thought well now we know we know where um, these calls are coming from it was uh, a couple called the shepherds they went to their house and uh, they in they interviewed them um, and thought well we've got our killer but the shepherds not only had had not there was nothing about them that uh, adhered to the profile that John had come up with. I mean, nothing. There was no, they they had no relationship to the profile, and they'd been out of town for uh, for for both murders. I mean, and it was documented they were out of town. So Lou McCarty, the uh, deputy sheriff, uh, started talking to them. And again, I'm short circuiting the story mm -hmm. just for the sake of uh, of the show here. Um, McCarty said, "Well." Do you know anybody who fits this description? And then he described John's profile exactly. And they said, well, yeah, that sounds like Larry Jean Bell. Larry Jean Bell was uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Ellis Shepard was an electrician. Larry Jean Bell uh, was working for him part time as an assistant. He was house sitting for them during uh, while they were out of town visiting their son in Alabama. And the whole thing kind of came together from that. Um, wow. so picked up Larry Jean Bell. And so this is one of those cases. And one of the reasons we wrote about it, it's a case where behavioral profiling, really good detective work and forensic science came together uh, to, um, to catch somebody who was really, really dangerous and a really bad guy. And so... Um, uh, they interrogated him for about seven or eight hours, got nothing out of him. Finally, um, uh, Sheriff Met said, well, John, why don't you take a try? John sat there and talked to him and went through the whole profile and what they'd found and what they'd found uh, through the, uh, the FBI's research. And finally got Larry Jean Bell to say, well, as I'm sitting here, the good Larry Jean Bell couldn't have done this. But the Larry, bad Larry Jean Bell might have been able to, might have done this. And that was as close as they ever got to a confession. But, you know, you could say, well, this is a, um, this is a bipolar personality. This is a schizophrenic mm -hmm. personality. This is a dissociative uh, multiple personality. Um, or you can say this is somebody who is looking for a way out to explain what so he's done. So because they had the, the bodies, do you think that's why they didn't offer him a plea for a full confession on not giving him the death penalty? Um, I don't think that would have made a, a, a difference, um, Chris. I think, first of all, they des the South, he knew that South Carolina was a death penalty state. And I think after what had happened, the outrage in the community, there was no way they were going to bargain this down. The issue, the issue was going to be uh, uh, Donnie Myers, the uh, the solicitor, the uh, district attorney. Um, he knew that his work was cut out for him in terms of can I prove that this guy was rational, sane, maybe crazy, if you will, but rational and sane enough to commit this act, to know what he was doing, and to do it again. Um, it, 
and you know, I think his actions, his actions speak for themselves. Um, he was he was very methodical. He was very organized. He even disguised his voice. He only stayed on the phone long enough so that uh, so that he could uh, say what he wanted to say and not get caught. In fact, toward the end of the book, we uh, we go through all of the uh, all of the things that showed. And obviously, during these two trials, you had a battle of psychiatrists saying yes, he's sane; no, he's not. Um, but well, even John's interview, you know, that yeah. could be used as both, you know, as proof that he wasn't sane. You know, saying, "Well, the good." Mm -hmm. the, you know, good Larry Bell, you know, no, no, there's no way. But the bad one. John testified at both trials, at both the Smith trial and the Helmick uh, murder trial. And uh, I think he, he went a long way toward convincing the jury that this guy was at least rational enough to know what he was doing and to be able to um, and to be able to um, control his actions if he wanted to. Uh, he didn't want to. This again, it's hard for ordinary people like us to understand this is what's most important to these people. Uh, this was what um, some of these guys are on the hunt nightly. You take somebody like uh, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer who operated for almost three decades in Wichita, Kansas. He had a job, he had a wife, he had two children. He was the president of his church. And yet these, these vicious murders uh, were yep. the most important thing in his life. This is what he thought about all the time. He made he drew pictures of it. Uh, he thought about it in his mind. And I guarantee you, sitting in prison today in Utah, he thinks about it every day and uh, reminisces about it. I guarantee it. I mean, just just for me, I mean, just the balance of that. I mean, just, just when you hear that, you've got the blind tor torture kill, you know, person. And he's at church. Yeah, I mean, he's, you're, you're, that's what that's what I'm right there. I mean, you think about this. Next time you're at church, mm -hmm. just picture the guy up there, you know, preaching. It's like could be sit, you know, in the, you have the BTK K he killer. Wasn't, he wasn't even the preacher. He was the elected no. president of the of the yeah. congregation. That's just you see somebody up there, like you said, on the podium, and like you said, next to the preacher, and you're just like, yeah. that guy could be doing the same exact thing yeah. that the BTK yeah. killer was doing, and it just yeah. you're like, oh it's my scary. god, yeah, it's scary, isn't it? The, the more and more you think about it, it, it is very demented to, to have the double life. I mean, some people live double lives, whether they cheat or they're a serial killer. I mean, I guess. But you come home and your kid's like, well, what did you do today, last night, Dad? Oh, I just went and hung out a little bit, knowing you just stalked somebody and killed somebody. And it's like you you go on about your daily life and well, I'll wait till the Chris, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, we we had in in our book uh, the killer across the table where it talks about John's prison interviews. Uh, we had um, one killer who would uh, who would rape and murder the daughters of friends of his um, because they were because they trusted him. I mean, usually you you want to stay away from people you know as victims, but he he thought it was easier this way because they trusted the girls trusted him and. Uh, after one of his murders, he went home to his uh, met up with his ex-wife and went to a parent teacher conference at the school. Same day. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> you know, by the same token, um, Ed Kemper, who uh, uh, the uh, co-ed killer from Santa Cruz, California, who figures mm -hmm. prominently in uh, in our uh, in our uh, Netflix series Mindhunter, he went to a uh, court mandated psychiatry appointment. Um, where the psychiatrist thought he was doing fine with the head of one of his uh, victims in the trunk of his car. Wow. Yeah. It, it's just, it's, I just, mean, I don't mean to be shocking. It's just, this no, is, it's, this is yeah. what these guys are like. I mean, it's literally, it's like they have a switch and they just go yeah. click, Yeah, you know, and, and nobody else is important. Only them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, we talked a little bit prior we, to the yes, show, are just actors in their drama. You know, and I maybe this is like a really good time to bring this in too. Is where you said like modern day, you know, how in in the courtroom, how hard it is because now everybody expects like lockdown, yeah, forensic evidence. Yeah. No, that's it's, a good point. It's what uh, it's what prosecutors um, disparagingly call 
the CSI effect. Uh, since these since these shows where everything wraps up neatly in an hour with all this forensic evidence, um, <laughs> a lot of prosecutors are concerned uh, that juries uh, in any kind of uh, violent case, particularly a murder case, they say, all right, where's the DNA? Where's the fingerprints? Where's the hair and fiber? Um, you know, that locks this in. And you don't often get that. I mean, people don't realize how, I mean, some surfaces, you know, adhere, fingerprints adhere really well. Most of them, they don't. Um, you know, if you've got a uh, cross uh, grooved uh, gun handle, that's not going to, uh, a pistol handle, that's not going to hold fingerprints very well. Um, it's very difficult to get DNA. I mean, if there's no actual um, bleeding, ejaculation, whatever, um, you're not going to get DNA necessarily. And sometimes there's some trace transfer DNA, but uh, don't count on it. Most cases don't have it, and uh, and juries expect it now. And that's that's what I that's one of my biggest problems with the court system. Like a guy like this, he could have clearly walked if because it's the states to prove the burden of evidence that he's guilty. So I mean, a guy like this could have very well walked if they didn't have convince the juries that he did it. Yeah. Well, in this in this case, fortunately, once they got to um, once they got to the shepherd's house and got a um, search warrant, um, which uh, John helped them get by saying what they expected to find, so to convince a judge, and also to his parents' house where he was living part of the time, to Bell's parents' house, they found a lot of in uh, a lot of. Uh, physical evidence that actually connected him to uh, primarily to um, the Smith case, but also to the Helmut case. So they did have that. But, you know, the irony is um, it might have taken, who knows if they would have gotten to him or certainly wouldn't have gotten to him in time without Sherry's letter. So, um, you know, yeah. the irony of ironies and, you know, the please God that this happened. Um, thank God that this happened. Um, Sherry solved her own case. You know, and as gut wrenching as it is, is to, I think it was really important that you guys sh um, added that into the book too. And I, that's on, that's on page forty one and forty two. You know, for people that look at that, it's, but that's you look in there and it just it's you just see, just the bravery that Sherry yeah. had in this. I mean, I, I don't. I would like to think that all of you know I could be as brave as she was. You know, I don't know if any of us could. And and Dawn said to us, you know, Dawn is a you know is a mature adult now. She said, I don't know how my 17 year old sister had that kind of courage, that kind of presence, that kind of faith, um, that kind of let's grace. I mean, that's what I would have to call it to be able to act like that. I I don't know if any of us would. And this um, this is such a tragedy, but such a tribute to this girl, um, mm -hmm. not even a woman yet. Um, the maturity, the, uh, just the, the courage that she had. And, um, you know, I think Dawn has kind of dedicated her life to Sherry's memory. And, uh, I just think that when you compare somebody like Larry Jean Bell and his encounter with Sherry Smith and the opposite extremes of the human condition, the human soul, if you will, that they represent. Um, I think this is one of the reasons that people really are so interested in true crime, because it really is about the human condition writ large at the extremes, all of the, all of the worst aspects of, of humanity and all of the best aspects come out. And, you know, as you've said, Craig, uh, this is a case where you know, they're really up front. What yeah, if, what this, if in, no, go ahead, Chris. What if in theory he made her write that letter as one taunting piece of the puzzle? Like, what if he made her write that? Not so much she had courage to write it. What if he told her, hey, we won't I won't kill you if you write the letter? So Yeah, she, that's that's not that's not what happened. It became clear. And what he said, we don't know if this is true or not. Uh he said he gave her the choice of how to die, and she chose um, asphyxiation, which I don't necessarily believe, but um, he certainly could have encouraged her or forced her to write a letter to her parents that would be taunting. There's no way he could have gotten her to say what she did. That had to come no. straight from her heart and straight from her soul. Yeah, I mean, just even... 
just the parts. It's like, you know, I don't want this to ruin your lives. Yes. Go on. Unbelievable. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, cause you can see it just, so people, when you get the book, you know, you got to get the book and read this thing. I mean, what, you, a testament, when, what a testament to the human soul. And that's all. I yeah. Cause say. you read this at no point. Is it ever about her? She's talking about, even in the PS it's, you know, grandma, I love you. Right. You know, like I said, none of this was ever feel sorry for me. I'm scared. Right. This was all like, you know, don't let this ruin your life. Keep yeah. moving on. Keep going. You know, I'm going to, it just, it was, I love you. It just, and that was the whole thing. It was never, there was never a me in this. You know, her, her grace and courage, you know, almost puts the rest of us to shame. I mean, oh I yeah. Say it. No, it, it was, yeah, it was, it was incredible, incredible moving, you know? Yeah. So I said, and I like how you guys, you have it right there. Just, for, you know, the whole yeah. thing. So definitely. And, you know, cause he was, he was executed on October 4th, 1996. The, this was a fast track um, execution. Yeah. Um, by, by current standards, it is. Um, we've written about other, uh, we've, we've written about other serial killers um, who were, or, Murder, uh, violent, uh, sadistic murderers who, who remained on death row longer than their victims were alive on earth. Um, South Carolina moved this along relatively quickly. And, um, yeah, I mean, and you know, again, it, it, at this point, the, uh, the main method of execution in, uh, in South Carolina was lethal injection. Yeah but they still had the carryover of the electric chair. If anybody wanted to go that route, um, Larry Jean Bell said he wanted to go that route because he associated the wooden electric chair with uh, Jesus's cross. And he considered himself a uh, martyr and like Jesus. So that's pretty misguided. The other thing I wonder, and you know, there's no way of telling about this, but he was an electrician. Um, is there, is it possible that he chose the electric chair because it was something he felt comfortable with? I don't know. It could, it could be because I know he, he also, uh, he also went to his death thinking that, um, that his victims were going to join him in heaven. Um, if there is a heaven, um, I can almost guarantee you he's not there. No, that's, and I was wondering, cause a couple of places like I was doing research on, you know, one speculated that he was, you know, that this is his way of going out as a tough guy. Yeah, maybe um, that's possible. Um, I I don't think he was that tough a guy. I think, yeah. uh, you know, also look, and anybody who's on death row for any period of time is going to get pretty introspective and um, has not a lot of people to talk to. So probably whatever, um, whatever mental illness he had probably got worse during that time or whatever narcissism he had probably got even more acute so that the only one he was thinking about at the time was himself. Now, since it's um, in the title of the book too, you know, criminal profiling, mm -hmm. I wanted to get to that question. And if between you and John, what do you think was, um, was probably the most key piece of the profiling side in this thing? Cause I know you had, you know, you had like the, the break and the, the phone number and stuff like that, but what, yeah. What part do you think was one where if you could look back, boil it down to a, a point and say, this was what I think was one of the keys? I think the combination of his criminal sophistication and um, ability to uh, control the situation and the voice uh, modulator and all of that, plus his extreme narcissism uh, and various references, really talked about the kind of person he would be. Um, uh, the, the method of abduction told them something about his personality too, as you'll see in here. So the fact that they were able to come up with such an accurate, um, such an, such an accurate profile and description of this guy, even to the fact that he would, he would, um, probably be divorced. He would, uh, have had, he would have been had mental institutionalist institutionalization at some time in his life that he had other sex crimes uh, before, but all of this stuff, the fact that they could be so, uh, that they could be so accurate about this really let uh, under Sheriff McCarty talk to the uh, shepherds and say, well, does this guy, does this description I'm giving you ring a bell? And immediately they focus on Larry Jean Bell. And because of that, um, also, when it came time 
right afterwards to uh, obtain search warrants, um, John had given them such specific information about what kind of things they would expect to find, um, mm -hmm. bondage and sadomasochistic pornography, that kind of thing, that that was very accurate too, um, and, let, and allowed them to obtain a search warrant. Um, and the search warrant um, to both uh, the two houses and his car really sealed the case. Wow. Yeah, that's, man, I want to show well, I mean, you know, I, I would have to say, Craig, you know, in, in the grim ledger of uh, murder investigations, this was a success. Two, oh, yeah. Two, two young women died. A, a, a young woman and a girl died and maybe three others um, before this time. But this was a success in that um, he was stopped before his career went any further. Oh, he could have easily been in the double digits. He would have gone on and on, no question about yeah. it. And the longer he went on, the more confidence he would have gotten, probably the more bizarre and elaborate his crimes would have gotten. Um, I suspect he probably would have tried to keep his victims alive longer and uh, torture them in whatever he way he could, not necessarily physically, but uh, certainly emotionally. Um, and he kept, uh, we, we, we don't know him as much about uh, what he did with Deborah May, but Sherry, he kept her chained to a, uh, uh, to a bed. And, um, you know, so it was, it was horrible. Wow. Yeah. That's, and that's, not only horrible, but he gloried in it and bragged about it and went on and on that, you know, rel reliving his his satisfaction uh, at the expense of the parents and the sister. Yeah, man, the name's failing me. It's they just had a documentary on it. It was the same guy. He he was all over the country killing people. He'd paint their pictures, and um, they just she no uh, this journalist just did a documentary on him. Um, it was he was one of the first like prolific black uh, serial killers. Wow. Hmm. I can't think of his name, but he was, it was one of those where they think it was anywhere between 80 and a hundred, you know, victims. Yeah. But it was the same thing. It was just, it's, it's that there's that other level where they revel in what they did. Yeah. Yep. You know, I mean, it's just like, he felt like every single one of his paintings was, you know, was basically an ownership over this victim. Well, it's good. It, it's, it's really important that you mention that because uh, mention the paintings because John sa always says, this is their art. If you want to understand the art, the artist, you have to look at the painting. You have to look at the art. And this is their art. Um, this is what they live for. This is what gives them the emotional satisfaction to go on. So by uh, uh. understanding the crime scene, by understanding the crime, um, you understand the, the you understand the perpetrator. That's now. Do you, or, you or as John says, why plus how equals who? That, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. So that's, um, you know, for me, it's like, so do you guys, how often are you going to put these books out, by the way? I mean, does, well, I know. Is, we have, we haven't, we have another one in mind. And then I think we, uh, we're going to do a, um, uh, we're, we're working on another book about uh, the, um, the defining characteristic of uh, every serial killer and violent predator, which is the signature aspect signature and modus operandi and the difference between them and we want to explain that and explain how they work in um, in the criminal personality so that's one and then we've got another book we we want to do on a uh, uh, on a in, on an, another individual case that that john did so uh we may keep at it for a while nice that's in, and on, that's on the on the brighter <laughs> side of things her sister was crowned um Miss South Carolina. In yeah, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought that up, Chris. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Dawn was a beauty pageant contestant. She was crowned uh, Miss South Carolina in 1996 and uh, came in third in the Miss America contest that year. So, um, and she did it with, uh, and her um, her talent was, uh, was opera singing. Uh, she did, I believe, a uh, an aria from Romeo from the opera Romeo and Juliet, and or Romeo and Julieta, I guess you would say in Spanish. But uh, um, so yeah, and she was she was quite talented, and um, she uh, at the time of the of of the murder, she was um, she was singing during the summer. She was going to uh, 
she was going to college and studying music and she was spending the summer at an amusement park, uh, theme park in um, Southern North Carolina. And Sherry was scheduled to join her there. And they were both going to uh, be part of a, uh, an, an, a singing troupe at, at the uh, theme park. And then Sherry was going to join her in the music college that fall. Yeah, and that's and I found this right here just to show for people who say. Yeah, so that's that was her during the, you know, singing and stuff during the, you know during that same performance. That's that's the sister. You can, and you can see how much she looks like Sherry. Mm -hmm. She does. Was it nineteen eighty six or nineteen ninety six? I noticed you just in my research. I came up with nineteen eighty six. Yeah, yeah, it was eighty six. Ninety six. Yeah, it was a nineteen. It was the year after the, the murder that she um, that she was in the contest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean that's 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 a testament just uh you know, being able to keep moving on the fact that not even a year later, you're, you know, you're back doing this, you know, getting back to somewhat of a normal. And she said it was routine. tough. It was really tough, but she knew that's what Sherry would have wanted for her to, uh, you know, to, yeah. to, to have Sherry live through her. Do you yeah. know if they were present at his, ex at his execution? No, they were, know? they were not. Um, I think one of her, one of her uncles came, but, uh, they didn't want to uh, dignify his death with their presence. They were in, they were in court every day, absolutely. And not only that, and they showed up in court for uh, for um, Deborah's trial as well. Wow, that's we gotta I gotta share this up here. But for anybody like what we've been talking about, I can't recommend enough. Go get the book. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Yes, mine is. Mine is here tomorrow. You know, it wasn't here early enough for this. I mean, it was it was one yeah, of those. Obviously, obviously, I you know we're here to uh, promote the book, but I I I do think um, more than anything having to do with me or even John, this really is a tribute to um, to an amazing young woman and uh, a fascinating important case. Yeah, I mean, if if this is telling for anybody, you you guys sent you know the publicist sent me a PDF of this book to, you know, prepare for the interview. I bought the book. I was on chapter three and I hit purchase through Amazon and I, wow. I, the book's on its way. So that's wow. why I said, just, I have a free copy on my phone mm -hmm. and the book is on its way. So I so I said, I would go because I wanted it one, the other, you know, stuff that isn't through the PDF that's going to be in the book, you know, like the, the pictures and stuff that you have there. But just the fact that, you know, it's easier, it's easier when you're, you want to stop and you want to search up stuff on Google. It's easier when you've got the book in your hand. Well, that's, that's, that's quite a tribute, uh, Craig. I really appreciate it. And I'll also say the pictures that you're referring to, um, a lot of them uh, Dawn gave us uh, and gave us permission to use and to share family photos. And I know that couldn't have been easy for her. So um, again, no, another, another tribute to the family. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, all you got to do is just click, see this like that, boom, click, 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 and then just add to cart and then purchase. And you have that book too. <laughs> so that's, that's really, that's really easy. But yeah, it's one of those, I, when you guys get to that next one, please let us know. I want to have you back. Well, I really, you guys are great interviewers. I, 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 I Thank you. Thank you very much. Cause like I said, this is, this is fascinating. I mean, I really definitely need to get more into this topic because these ones are just, I'm starting to get more and more interested in it. But yeah, that's the, I just, I can't encourage people enough. Please go purchase this book. You know, if you haven't, because this is, this is one you just, and while you're at it, I mean, if you really want to, you know, if you really want to go full on, just click the next one over there, you know, the combination one, because then you can get the killer shadow too. And, and then so, you know, if you want to see where it well started, uh, start with Mindhunter. Yep. And that's, yep. And, that's, and actually that's right down here for the bundle for 4330. And right now you can have all three books shipped to you right now. Oh, that's all I got to do. Amazon's already got it set up for you. So and also, once you read those books, make sure you leave leave him a review. Amazon is big on reviews. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Thank you, Chris. So and thank well, you guys. This this was a great interview. Well, pr appreciate that, sir. I really do. I mean, that means a lot, you know, because you get, you know, you're pretty much criminal profiling royalty, you know. So <laughs> it's it's one of those to have you say that that just means means quite a bit. So it's. But appreciate it. Tell, tell John, you know, it's well, like me. You know, I can tell you, you know, uh, as you might expect, I go on a lot of these uh, shows and show to this John. And 
you know, the kind of empathy and concern that you guys show is really a tribute to you and your and what you do. Well, th well, thank you. That's that's what we're what we've gone for. So that's a, you know, for it to be different, you know, because like I said, we don't want to be. I try not to make it too boring to where it's like I hate the one where I get the pre the preset questions and go down there. It's like I don't want you to come on here. I want you to have a whole different experience. So I'm I'm glad that worked out that way. So, well, Mark. Have a great evening, sir. Like I said, tell tell John hello. Like I said, one of these, one of these, we gotta try to get you both on at the same time. Great. Okay, guys. All Thank right. You. Well, have have a great night. Thank you. All right, everybody. This episode brought to you by threebeardspodcast.com. We're still trying to get that sponsor, but you can also help the show. Um, go to Outer Realms Bathworks and you can purchase a signature beard oil that um, Tanya has made for us. And so that's available through them. Through them, um, you can check them out. Outer Realms Bathworks, right here on Facebook, um, and appreciate that. Uh, we check us out on social media. We are pretty much everywhere: TikTok, Twitter. And we actually streamed to Twitter um, tonight, so this was the first time you know going live on Twitter. So hopefully soon we'll figure out how to get on TikTok as, at the same time as well. So I appreciate everybody watching. Uh, like, subscribe, hit the comments. Um, that really helps the algorithm with the comments. And so just keep doing the questions. We appreciate those. Um, share with people. Most importantly, out of the whole thing um, is just one. Ed, just go pick up the book. That's, I can't, I, yeah, I can't recommend that enough. Go pick up the book. And the show will be rebroadcast um, most likely next week on ERRT radio, 11 p.m. Wednesday. We follow out of the outer realms and so I will be in just a little teaser. I'll be on that show tomorrow. So we can check that out. We're going to be talking about angels and demons. So everybody, so go, go to that. Um, you can go to redbubble.com as well. That's our merchandise. Um, you can find that through three beards podcast as well. So everybody, Mark Holshaker, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. So appreciate that. And we will be in, we'll be in touch. We'll definitely you know, get you on for the next, the next one here. So everybody, thanks for watching. Have a great night. Go get that book.